Father, we thank you so much. You're awesome. And we thank you that we get to, week after week, go through your word. And we pray that you speak to our hearts. Thank you for the beauty of your protection, how you provide, your mercy that's everlasting. Lord, I pray that you would work powerfully in our hearts and speak poignantly through your word this morning. Amen. All right, so we are in Genesis chapter 4. If you would turn with me in your Bibles. So as we just discussed, uh, the creation, pretty awesome in in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. But as we get into Genesis chapter 3, we saw the fall of man. Because Satan, who used to be an anointed cherub, he used to be an anointed angel, somehow fell from heaven with one third of all the stars of heaven, like Revelation says. And he came to the scene, and what did he do? He questioned the word of God. Did God really say that? Did he really say that you can't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And then he told her, God is holding out on you. You know, he knows that if you eat of that fruit, you'll be just like him. That's why he doesn't want you to eat it. So she started thinking. Then he said, you will not die. To Eve, and she bought that hook, line, and sinker. So, no pun intended, but he used the three things, and we discussed the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And Satan still uses, he still is very stuck on those tools. All right? And so, every time we're tempted, just like Eve, we can look at things and see that they're pleasant to the eye. We can see that they may make us feel more wise or like we've got a one-up on somebody. But at the end, if we think that we'll be like God or that we'll we'll be more powerful, that's that's the, the most poignant time when we are just like Satan because he wanted to be like God. What we want to do is say, God, you are God, and I'm content with what you've given me. And so we looked at Philippians where Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content. And what we just studied in 1 Timothy is many false teachers will think that godliness is gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So being content with what God has given, Satan will try to capitalize that. I think we need to be weary that Satan will try to make you think that what you have is not good enough. Right, Joe? He's going to make you think you don't have enough. You need more, more, more. And so that's why I'm not watching the Super Bowl tonight. Anyway, I'm just joking, but kind of not. All right, so chapter 4, verse 1, let's pick up. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. When does life begin? Conception, right? So she conceived. It's very important that we understand that. And Planned Parenthood does not. And liberals do not. But life begins at conception. So they knew one another. Once, once again, this is Adam and Eve. This is what the Bible says and what Jesus later affirms. That a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. They didn't have a father or mother. But they did obey and cleave to, their, to one another and become one flesh. Um, we've had the privilege of having five little... Uh, one fleshes <laughs> walking around here. <laughs> They're pretty interesting. They are so different from one another, but we have wonderful children. But she was rejoicing. She said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time, his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought Forth an offering or brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flocks and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Why does your face look so glum? Why such a long face? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. We'll pause there for a minute.
So one thing I've learned being a parent is that every child is different and have different desires and have different, uh, sometimes hobbies and skills and, and, and interests, but, but sometimes it's, when you get to the root of the problem between a conflict between a sibling, you know, brother, sister, even a person, one person to another, it usually boils down to the heart, right? So we look at this, and God, in the process of time, Cain brought an offering of fruit to the Lord, fruit of the ground. Let's think about this. Cain was a hardworking farmer. Many of us are hardworking people, right? As we look through from Genesis to Revelation, God speaks very clearly that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You know, we need to get this straight. He also says obedience is better than sacrifice. So what was it exactly? We, we see that he did not respect. Uh, he, uh, Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel in his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry. I think it's in 1 John 2 that... We have an explanation there that the heart of Cain was wicked. Do you ever give a gift to the Lord kind of, hey, you know, I'm going to do this. And deep down, you're not realizing you're doing it, but you're giving and you're okay if other people see you give. You're kind of doing it with this intent in your heart saying, you know, it's about me. And I think it's hard, but Cain, one of the first men to ever live on this earth, he struggled with something. He struggled that his heart was evil. And God talked with him and gave him the solution to his struggle. But as we see, as we see here, his struggle was this. My countenance fell when I saw that God honored this person and didn't honor me. Cain looked at his brother and said to himself, whatever he said, he was angry and he looked down with dismay. Have you ever gotten to a point where the Lord is disciplining you? Hebrews says, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Proverbs says, his discipline is for your good. Well, this is what was happening. Cain was being disciplined and his heart was evil, as we see in 1 John. I'll get the reference for you um, in a little bit, but not today, right now. But it says the problem with Cain was his heart was evil. And Abel, he was just right before the Lord. It's such a sweet thing to just want to be right with the Lord. Abel was just desiring to seek after him. Now, Abel just brought an animal. My dad used to raise goats, used to raise sheep. And they're dirty and they're stinky. But trying to plow a 100-acre field versus trying to just follow a few goats around, it's a different thing. And to have a goat that is, or a lamb that is spotless or that is in good shape, that's all God. Because only God can control their genetics. Only God can make sure they're born healthy. Only God can do um, that. But when you're talking about a harvest, you know, some people, they'll pick apart. Well, was it because he brought grain and he didn't bring an animal that God didn't receive him? No. First John, he clearly states that Cain was a man of faith um, and he was righteous. And it was simply put that Cain, Cain was able, able, sorry, Cain was evil and Abel was righteous. So because of this, the Lord said what he says to us sometimes. Verse 6, why are you so angry? And why is your face fallen? Have you ever looked in the mirror and you're like, man, my face has fallen, right? And Cain was grumping around. And the Lord said, why is this happening? Remember what he said last chapter? The, they heard the sound of the Lord walking around the cool of the garden. Verse 8, Adam and his wife, they, they hid themselves. And verse 9, God says, where are you? You know, God, he knew where they were. God knew why Cain was upset, right? 
God knew that Cain had hatred and evil in his heart, right? Does God know that you have evil and hatred or sin in your heart? Or he, does he know exactly where all the sin is in our hearts? Yes, he does. So, but he still has the gentleman type character to ask us, why? Why are you going through this? I wish I was a better father like that with my kids. Why are you upset? Said usually I'm like, stop being upset, right? Or knock it off. Or hey, you guys need to get along. Problem solved. But I think sometimes it is that take the kid aside. And this is God reaching out to one of his, his uh, someone made in his image. A child of one of his direct. It says in the Bible that Adam was a son of, was a son of God. Because he came straight from God breathing him out of the earth. So he's only once removed from Adam, and God's just wanting to have this relationship. Why are you so angry? So maybe today you're in a place and you're angry. God would question, okay, why are you so angry? Because it's not a bad thing to be angry necessarily. As we read in the New Testament, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Uh, be angry, but sin not, it says. If you do well, verse 7, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well. Sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Let's think about that. Jesus gave us the model prayer and he said, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. There is something of needing the Lord to deliver us. We need his hand and his power, but we also need to recognize the temptation when we're in it and we need to see it from afar off. If I know something is really tempting to me, I'm wiser if I just cut it off. If I know it's no good for me, why do I keep doing it? So that's kind of the question here. If you do well, won't you be accepted? If you let this, this anger, jealousy, and bitterness go away, not very many people will be, will be defiled. Hebrews says, let not a root of bitterness rise up so that many will be defiled. If you're getting bitter like Cain, guess what? You're going, you should rule over that. You should let that go and lay it down at the feet of Jesus Christ. I should lay it down. I should not be bitter. Now, maybe you had something like me that happened this week and you're just like, man, I could be really bitter about this. Or you say, Father, I just give this to you. I need your protection. Then his question here is, you should rule over this. Why are you so angry? Give it to me, Cain. Get right with me, Cain. Figure out what it is that I want, and you'll be fine. And sin won't have a place over you. But if you don't do well, sin's right at the door. Sin is very easy to go to. If you really want to disobey God, there's a million, billion, trillion ways to disobey God. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many are that find it. So isn't it amazing? Guys, let's just stop here and think about this for a second. Isn't it amazing that the God of Genesis chapter 4 is the same as the God who Jesus says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way to lead to life. Isn't it amazing that Jesus is showing us a couple thousand years later the exact same message? Isn't that awesome? And it's right here. I can only imagine that on the road to Emmaus that Jesus pointed this out to the two men who couldn't recognize him. I can only imagine that after Paul was, was brought this blindness, like scales fell from his eyes when Ananias prayed for him. He was blind for three days after he got knocked down off of his horse to the road to Damascus. That God ministered to his heart and said, see, it's right here, Paul. The gospel is right here, Paul. I've been trying to get people to repent ever since Cain and Abel, ever since Adam and Eve, Paul, Saul, now Paul. And that's the amazing thing. Paul and Peter and James and John and Matthew and Mark and Luke, they did not have the New Testament. If anything, they were referring to stories like this as their New Testament. This was their, their scripture that they had memorized from their youth. So I'm sure people are thinking, man, that question that God asked Cain, why are you so angry? It still rings true today. Why are people so angry against the God who made them? Because the God of this world, Satan, has blinded their eyes so that they may not see the truth, how God loves them and how his mercy endures forever. 
So clearly we see here, God is in the good news business from the get-go. He doesn't want murder. He doesn't want pain. Because this is all before verse 8 when Cain strikes his brother. So think about that. Is God the same God of the Old Testament and the New Testament? Absolutely. Is his character the same? Does he change? Not. He does not change. Okay. Isaiah 46 says, I am the Lord God. I change not. He says, who is like me? Who can, who can declare the end from the beginning? The end from the beginning. God knows it. And he doesn't change. I'm thankful for that. Verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel and his brother and killed him. You know, there is a lot of validity, but there's also a lot of irrationality about we need gun control. Right? We need to get rid of all these assault rifles. Right? Well, guess what? Cain did not need a gun. Okay? And if people can't get guns, they'll use rocks or knives or swords or poison or whatever they can get their hands on. So let's remember that. I know this point that's been said many times. But Cain, this is, we don't know how he killed him. We just know he rose up against him and he killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, I'm sure this broke his heart, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I don't know. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I, don't, I do not know. He said, Am I my brother's keeper? Am I his guardian? Am I the one who has to always look after him? Isn't that a really weird response? <sighs> Rich Mullins had a song where the words were uh, how he wanted to be his brother's keeper. You know, part of the redemption, if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, you're saved, you believe that he died on the cross for your sins. You believe he's all you need. He's your way, your truth, your life. He's not only your savior, he's your Lord. Guess what? You are now redeemed in the kingdom and you are your brother's keeper. You are a guardian for your other brothers and sisters. We do look after one another. We do protect one another. So clearly we see here, he is questioning our role. When you are right with God, you do want to help other people, right? We have 200 plus volunteers here and people who want to volunteer because they care about other people. That's awesome. I would be hard pressed to find churches within 10 mile radius that have that many people that just want to serve and help other people. It's because Christ and God of the Bible has saved my soul and I want to look after them. Now Jesus made it very clear in the New Testament. If you have ought against your brother or you're hateful or you got this problem with someone, be reconciled. Go to them, show them their fault or, or reconcile or, or make it right with that person so that you can get at peace with man. Because if you can't be at peace with certain people that God wants you to be at peace with, he doesn't want your offering. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your gifts. He wants you to be made right with that person that you need to be made right with. Sometimes it's impossible because that person moved out of country and there's no way to get a hold of him. Okay, but if you have a way to make things right, Cain sealed the deal when he killed his brother Abel and he couldn't make it right with his brother on this side of heaven. But if Cain were to give his life to God at this point and say, you know what? I sinned. Just like Adam and Eve when they ate the fruit, I messed up. If he would have said it at this point, then this whole rest of the chapter would have gone differently. And I can assure you, God would have done a work that, that we would have been amazed by. But instead, what happens here? He says, I don't know where he is. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I his guardian? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. He's like, you've got blood on your hands. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. 
Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Okay. If Cain would have said what David said with Bathsheba, I have sinned against God. I have sinned. I'm the man. I'm the one who needs to repent. I've sinned against the Lord and against Abel. If he would have said that, God may not have cursed him. But instead, because he retorted back with an unrepentant, unbroken, prideful heart, God said, guess what? You're just getting started. Work is going to be hard, and you're going to have to roam, like Elton John says in Lion King, for kings and vagabonds, right? You're going to be a vagabond, a, stra a, a stranger, and a straggler on the earth, and people, when they see you, it's bad news. No one's going to want to be around you. And he put a mark on him. In Revelation, uh, later on in the Bible, we see that people will willingly take a mark. But this, he took a mark. And I will tell you, this is atrociously, wickedly terrible. But the Mormons taught that that mark of Cain was black skin. Hello? Noah and his three sons are the only ones who survived the flood. Cain and all of his descendants were gone. That is completely wrong theology, wrong teaching. The mark was a mark. And it is no excuse to be racist or discriminatory toward anyone. So he has this mark. The scarlet letter, so to speak, right? He, he has this stigma. Everywhere he goes, he feels his life is in jeopardy. So God says, if someone kills you, you're going to, they're going to be punished seven times as strong. So as we move forward, verse 16. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. Okay, well, at least he got a wife, right? He knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. This is not the good Enoch. This is not the one we named our son after. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of that city after the name of his son, Enoch. Enoch was born, uh, to Enoch was born Irad. Irad begot Mahujael. Mahujael begot Methusael. Methusael begot Lamech. Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, or Ada, and the other one was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was a father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock, so campers and shepherds. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and the flute, so he was the one who invented music. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. So here you have Tubal Cain where they had foundries and they had metal and steel smiths and they had all sorts of weapons. We'll, we'll see later on um, with the Tower of Babel that God, uh, with people's technology, wasn't necessarily always a good thing, but they did have technology. Then Lamech said to his wives, this is an interesting character, Lamech. He's kind of like Cain. He's pretty wicked. And you'll see why. He said to his two wives, why does he have two wives, right? Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. It's like if, if they're going to be punished for killing Cain, then my punishment should be worse because I'm such a hot shot. For one, he killed somebody without cause, okay? For two, he's got two wives. Why? Right? And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain has killed. That's what she said. And we almost named our son Seth, because it, God's appointed another son. But I'm like, I don't want my sons to murder each other, so I don't want to name Seth. No, I'm just joking. But the thing is, she was excited to have a seed. And we'll see that the line of Christ comes through Seth, that God brought righteousness through the line of Seth. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, 
and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Okay. People began to call God his rightful name and have a relationship with him at that time. And we're going to move forward next week, but here we see murder. Here we see pride. Here we see polygamy. Here we see curse. And we see a man roaming as a vagabond. All of this could have been avoided. Could have been avoided if one word would be said. I re- and the word is repent. I repent. I change my mind. I have sinned. Okay? Those words, those sweet words. And then what do those words get followed up with? I believe you forgive. I need you. Okay? So this morning, if you've never repented, you've never believed, we're going to give you that opportunity to not be cursed, but to have eternal life. Father in heaven, the Lord, we call upon your name. And I believe, Father, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for my sins. And I receive you. I repent. I don't want to be like Cain. I turn from my wicked ways. I need you. To save me. I need you to lead me and be my Lord. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being my Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the power to live for you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that, welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the kingdom. And you are not cursed. You have life. You don't have to be a murderer. You can walk in the newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We get to walk in that newness. And for those of us who are believers, let's pray that God will keep our hearts fresh and pure, righteous like Abel, like Hebrews 12 says, and Hebrews 11.4, that we would have a righteous faith and that we would also call upon his name. Father, we praise you this morning for your word and how you preach the gospel to us from Genesis to Revelation. We pray that you would help us to not have hatred in our hearts. We pray that you would help us not to be prideful, but help us call upon your name and let your name be a strong tower that we run into it and we're safe and that we would shine your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a blessed morning.